Bible characters we are allowed to study and of all the characters from which we glean our lessons of life in the scriptures, none are more instructive than David. Did you realize that next to Jesus Christ, the Lord dedicates more Bible to David than any other person in the scriptures? There's something like 66 chapters in the Old Testament about David, and there's 59 references to David in the New Testament. That's a lot of scripture. So what do you think that the Lord has tried to tell us about David? Uh, the story of David begins with David as a young boy, and the story really never ends. Though David's death is recorded, his story still goes on. You know, again, what do you think the Lord is attempting to tell us through David? David's story moves from great faith to great doubt, from great confusion to great confidence, from great fear and great sin to great success and great victory. His life is is like a ride at Disney World. You know, it's up and then it's down and then there's a curve and then there's a sharp snatching turn. And David's life was seldom smooth. It's kind of like our lives. Yet David is the only person in all the Bible to whom God refers as a man after God's own heart. I want to read you that passage. It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. David experienced every emotion you and I will ever experience. The wonderful thing about the story of David is that we are given the detailed steps that took David into those experiences and the detailed steps as to how he came out of those experiences. David was anything but perfect. In his up moments, no one was better. In his down moments, no one was worse. He lusted as a husband. He was weak as a father. He made horrible decisions in life. <laughs> he was hated by people. He became angry. He was disciplined by God. When David kept his heart right though and focused on God, giants fell. When he didn't, David fell. Same with you and me. Yet amazingly, through all those experiences and all those sins and all those emotions, David was able to keep his heart right with God, or he would repent quickly to get his heart back right with God. Now to me, that's why so much is written in the scriptures about David. God is saying to you and God is saying to me, learn from David. That's why I wrote so much about him. If you will, you will learn how to keep your heart right toward God. You will learn how to keep your heart right toward people. You will learn how to keep your heart right toward your family. You will learn how to keep your heart right towards your friends. You will learn how to keep your heart right towards yourself. You too can be a person after God's own heart. And your story will continue on and on after you. Let's study David. What I want us to accomplish in our study of the series of David is I want us all to climb a little higher. I want us all to stand a little taller. I want us all to do a little better. I, I want us to realize that though we face, face giant problems in our lives, that, that we have giant depression, we have giant situations with our children or with our families or with our spouses, we have, we have giant times of, at work, we have these giant situations going on in our lives. But, but if we'll just keep our heart focused, if we can be people after God's own heart, then we're going to come out of those situations better than we were when we went into those situations. That's what I really want us to learn. We can really be young men and young women, old men and old women who are after God's own heart. If we can do that, we're going to come out of this thing as better people. Also, I want us to understand how God is working in our lives all the time, which takes us to our first point when we study about David. When we look at David, one of the very first principles we see is this one. God is working behind your scenes. I want you to say that to me. Would you say that? God is working behind your scenes. Say that. God is working 
behind your scenes. Tell me, say, Delbert, God is working behind your scenes. Thank you. And sometimes I need to know that. You know it? And so do you. Would you say that now in a personal way? Would you say God is working behind my scenes? Say that. Behind my scenes. God is working behind the scenes. Now let me set the scene up for you for David just a little bit. It was a strange time for the people of God prior to, to David becoming king. Let me set it up. It was, uh, it was a time when God led his people and ruled his people with what he called judges. Judges. Now Samuel was the judge at this time. Samuel was the last judge. Samuel was a great judge, but he was a horrible father. And he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, Hophni and Phinehas were lawless guys. They were, they were the epitome of the preacher kids, you know? <laughs> and they were horrible. They were lawless. And so as Samuel aged, the people came to Samuel and said, Samuel, we don't want Hophni and Phinehas over us anymore. We don't, after you're gone, we don't want them to be our leaders. We want a king like the other nations. Now, what does that mean? So you have to imagine yourself living in the year 1000 B.C., if you're going to really get an idea of this. Just imagine, uh, there is no law. There, 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 there are, is no law enforcement. There, there's, there's, no, there's no police. There's no sheriff. There's no National Guard. Uh, there's no state patrol. There's no FBI. There's nothing except a judge. One guy trying to take care of the law and the order. And so they're saying, man, we, we, want, we want us a king because we want some law and some order. There's a scripture that kind of uh, typifies the time for us. It's in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, and it says this, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he or she saw fit. C can you imagine the lawlessness of that time? You see, what would happen is, is the strong and the powerful would take advantage and abuse the weak and the poor. Uh, they, they would use them. Even the people of God did this. The people of God took advantage of other people of God. Aren't you glad it's not like that today? Aren't you glad that the people of God never take advantage of one another? Or is it kind of the same way? that each of us kind of in our heart want to do as we see fit. See, uh, God's going to give them what they're wanting. And initially, what happened is Samuel said, no, we're not going to do this. But then the Lord spoke to Samuel. I want to read you this. It's in 1 Samuel 8, 7, and it says, And the Lord told him, Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me. As their king. Now we, we never do that, do we? we? We never reject the Word of God. We always do what the Word of God says, right? Or do we do as we see fit in our own eyes? You see, the reason that the things were like they were in this time was because they rejected the ways and the laws of God. Had they obeyed the ways and the laws of God, they would need no law enforcement. Hello? And if we did that, you see, how different would our life change? So God's going to give them, you know, sometimes God's going to give them what they want. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we think we know what we want and what we need. And we're wrong. How many of you would admit that there was a time that you wanted something and you thought you needed it only to find out it really wasn't that good for you? Anybody? Yeah. But you know what? God will give it to you. God, God let you have it. And the horrible thing about it is he'll give it to you so that you'll learn a lesson for later. Or that maybe you'll teach by doing this a lesson to your children so they won't do it later. But God will give it to you. He'll let, he'll let you have it just so he can teach you a lesson. See, God knows perfectly well what we need. <laughs> the problem is we don't know what we need. So what happens in our lives, if your life is up and down, roller coasters, 
like David's was. If you're going this way and this way, and life never really seems smooth and, and, and even, it's probably because you're doing as you see fit in your own eyes. And probably, as, 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 you, as, I, as, I'm, as I'm just talking, talking about here, is you're wanting things that you really don't need. God gave the people Saul as their king. Uh, who was exactly what they wanted, but definitely not what they needed. Let me show you this. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, 23, it says this. He, speaking of Saul, stood head and shoulders above anyone else. Big, nice-looking guy. Then Samuel said to all the people, This is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. Now, I don't know if you know the story or not. If you've read your Bible, hopefully you do. But there is humor here. Okay, this is what you want, this is what you got. Because, because Saul became a maniac, a demon-possessed, psychotic maniac. This is the Lord, this is the man that the Lord has chosen for you. You asked for it, you got it. <laughs> you got it. And he goes on. He said to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen for you for, as, as your king. No one in all of Israel is equal to him. But they were right about that. And all the people did what? They shouted, long live the king. <laughs> when we get what we want, we shout, praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And sometimes we do that just a little too soon. Because it just could be something that he's going to teach you a lesson for life with. Saul looked like a king, but he, he didn't have a heart for God. He didn't really save the ship as all had hoped. He actually nearly sunk it. <laughs> Saul became a very lawless, psychotic person. And he continually disobeyed God. Time after time after time, he would get instructions as to what to do, and he would do totally something, something totally opposite. And finally, one day, the Lord got tired of it, and he says, that's it, no more. I want you to make sure you get the point here. God will let you do what you want to do for a period. But there comes a time when the hammer comes down. He says, that's it, no more. You're not doing this anymore. And here's what happened in... In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 26, but Samuel said to him, speaking of Saul, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Now, please get this. He hasn't rejected Saul, but he's rejected Saul as what? As king. You see that? When the Lord gets upset with us, he's not rejecting us. But what we're doing is just not what he wants us to do. And as long as Saul remained in that position, it wasn't good. And we're going to see this as we progress through our study. Now, I think it's important that we see that. He hadn't rejected him, but he rejected him as king. Now, this was about 10 years into the time of Saul's reign when God sent David onto the scene. Now, Saul's failures and Saul's mess-ups and, and Saul's being rejected by God did not mess up God's plan. I want to make sure we, we see this. It didn't catch God off guard. Um, God was working behind the scene. You see, I want you to get the point here because, because people... But let, me, let me do it this way. If, uh, if, if someone dies, does God die? Of course not. So if someone messes up, is it messing up God? No. And when someone dies, God's got somebody else raising up because God's been working behind the scene, raising this person up to take this place. And so when we mess up in life, when before, before they even wanted Saul as king, God was working behind the scenes. David, this was like eight or ten years into the time of Saul. Uh, David's a teenager, so way before they even decided they want a king, God was working behind the scenes. God was raising up David. Before, before Saul ever... Reject, was rejected by God. God was working behind, behind the scenes. But before, before you messed up or before I messed up, I want you to know that God was working behind the scenes. Your mess up or my mess up didn't mess up God's eternal plan. God's got a plan. And though we mess up, it's not going to catch God off guard because God is working behind the scenes. Would you say that? God is working behind the scenes. 
That's extremely important because I want you to realize he's working in your life behind, behind the scenes. God is always working in our lives behind the scenes. Let me read you this. 1 Samuel 16, 1, and it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen, now get this part, don't, don't, don't lose this one. I have chosen one of his sons <laughs> to be king. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Now, what's God showing us here? God's already, God's already got somebody chosen to replace Saul. Why is that? Because God's been working behind the scenes. Now, it's interesting that, that he says, go, go to Bethlehem, find Jesse, and, uh, and I want you to anoint one of his sons. He had eight sons. It was, it was cool that I saw, when I saw that, that, that he didn't say, I want you to go and anoint David. He said, I want you to go and, an did God know who he was going to anoint? But why didn't he tell Samuel? <laughs> I want you to go. And you're going to have these eight guys, and I want you to anoint one of them. I'll show, you know, and, you know, and you're thinking, now, why is that? Why didn't he just tell him, David? Why did he have to go through this whole process? There is a real major truth that Samuel needed to learn, and a real major truth that you and I need to learn here. This is, this is, this is so major in our lives. Major enough that God put it here in the scriptures so we would learn it. So let's see, Samuel didn't understand it yet. Let's see if you and I have gotten it, okay? So here we go. Now Bethlehem was just this tiny little map dot. Now let's make this practical. So God's going to send a man of God to Lafayette or, or to Rock Spring or to Fort O or to Ringgold or, or to Somerville or to Tryon or to Halls Valley or to Villanelle. Uh, yeah, God's going to send, and he's going to be looking for you because he wants to anoint you. Or he's going to be looking for your child because he wants to anoint your child. And what I want us to see is that God is working behind the scenes because David had no idea that Samuel and God were talking about him. Do we have any idea that God's having conversations, communicating with people, communicating with men and women of God about us? God is working. God is working behind the scenes. He is working behind your scenes right now. And so, so here comes, here comes, here comes Samuel. And he's coming down, uh, work, as God is working behind the scenes, and he's looking for whoever it is he's going to anoint. Now, for years, God has been working behind the scenes. God has been, God has been preparing this guy named David to move into this, this position. In, in solitude, he has been preparing David by shepherding sheep to be in a place where he can step into it by in, by in public leading people. God, God has been preparing David all of these years, working behind the scene. God has been preparing David behind the scene to kill a lion and to kill a bear with a sling so that in public he can step in and take out Goliath and take out Philistines. God, God has been preparing behind the scenes. David, sitting in solitude, learning to play a harp, writing music, writing psalms and singing, so that as we're going to see next time, so that when the door opens, that he can step into the next position, the next place that God has for him, into the palace. God is working behind the scenes. And I want you to make sure that you know that God is working behind your scenes. And because your spouse fails or because your children fail, or because your boss fails, or because your preacher fails, or because anybody fails, or because you fail, does not mean that it catches God off guard. Why? Because God is working 
behind the scenes. And what is so cool and what I really want you to get is when things do get crazy in your life, when, when, when do, life does throw you an unexpected curve or jerk or, or, or throws you an unexpected problem in life, what you really need to learn to do is do what we've, we're learning here in David is to step back, stop, and take a moment and figure it out. Now, what is God doing behind the scene? Is God working behind your scenes? God is working. So early in the morning, here comes, here comes Samuel leading a heifer for a sacrifice, heading for Bethlehem to find Jesse and his boys. Same morning, same morning, David gets up, goes to the sheepfold, takes out his sheep and heads for the pastures, leading his sheep. Sun rose just like it always did. Heaven didn't split open. There wasn't a trumpeting angel that came down and said, do -do 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 -do. today's the day we're going to anoint David. Wasn't like that at all. But it was a day that changed David's life forever. See, you don't know what God's doing behind the scene, but he's doing something in your life and in my life and one day, our life just changes forever. God is working. God is working behind the scene. God has some extremely exciting things ahead for you. Some of you are going to get it tomorrow or, or, or the day after or maybe next week or maybe next year. We don't know when we're going to get it. We just know that God is working behind the scenes and he's making all things good. For those who love him are those who have a heart for him. If you have a heart for God, God is going to make everything in your life come out well. Let me show you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, and we know. How many of us really know this? We should know it. <laughs> I know it. She knows it. You really know it. You just hadn't figured it quite out yet. But we know that how many things? All things, bad things, good things, medium things, bad things, medium things, bad things, good things, all things work together for what? Good. For good. Now, God's always working, but he's only working good for who? To them that love, love God. Key. You have a heart for God? Preaching to the choir here just a little bit. If you have a heart for God, I want you to know it's going to work out good for you. For them that love God, to them that are the call according to his purpose. Right now, I want you to know God is working good things behind your scene. <laughs> now, that's the first thing that I really want us to get is God is working behind the scene. Good. Second principle that I see when we look at the life of David is God is looking at your heart. Tell me. Say, Delbert. Say it, Delbert. God is looking at your heart. <laughs> now, you say, God is looking at my heart. God is looking at my heart. When you really realize that God's looking at your heart, ooh, what's in there? What's he seeing? Samuel arrived at Bethlehem. He found Jesse. He told Jesse his mission. Jesse began to bring all the boys in front of him, all of them but one. He brought seven of them. And the, and the oldest one was one guy named Eliab. Now, I told you earlier that Samuel needed to learn this lesson, and, and we need to learn this lesson. This is a major lesson in life. Did it, did, did, do we know this? Have we learned this lesson? So let's see if we have. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, it says this, And they arrived, the boys, Samuel saw Eliab, he's the oldest, and thought, wow, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. GQ guy, you know. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have what? I've rejected him. It's not that he's rejected him, he's rejected him as being the leader. He's rejected him from this position. Now, I want to make this relevant for us. How many times do we not get the position that we want for the same reason that Eliab didn't get the position that he wanted? He says, I've rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord helps me. The Lord what? Looks at the heart. God is looking at your heart. You say, he rejected him. Even the great Samuel needed to learn this, the prophet of God. When, when you see people, what do you look at? Do you look at the outward appearance? Or do you look at the heart? The Lord is looking at your heart. It's your heart. <laughs> now, I know you've heard this verse before. You've probably heard it quoted for you all, all the time. You know, you just hear, you know, God looks at the heart, doesn't look at the outward. But do you know that it was in direct connection with David's being anointed as king? It's, it's in direct connection with David's life changing forever. Uh, David had a heart that God was looking for. You know, God's not really interested in the square footage of your house or the tag in your clothes or, or, or the automobile that you drive or the bank account that you have. God, now, he doesn't, he's not against any of those things. I'm going to show that to you in just a second. But, 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 but what God is really majorly concerned about is your what? Heart. Your heart. God's looking at, at the heart. Samuel, like, like most of us, became enamored. Whoa, surely, this is the Lord's anointed. He became enamored with Eliab. I was uh, watching O'Reilly Factor. Anybody watch O'Reilly Factor? <laughs> Good. Well, I was watching O'Reilly Factor, and Dennis Miller was on there. He's on there every week, but, but this particular time, and I hadn't really given Dennis Miller a lot of space up until this particular moment. It changed my thinking about him. And I saw this guy's really got something going on. And so, so he said this, uh, uh, Bill O'Reilly questioned Miller, uh, something concerning President Bush. I can't remember the exact, the exact thing. And I would guess I was expecting something negative to come out of Dennis Miller. And, uh, and he didn't. He said, he said, I'm enamored with Bush. Now, I'm sitting in my chair, my feet's up in, in, my, in my chair, and I'm working on my computer. And when he says that, I said, whoa, enamored. En enamored. And, and Bill O'Reilly did the same thing. He kind of did a double take, too. And he made Dennis Miller said, to explain himself just a little bit. What do, you, what do you mean you're enamored? He said this. He says, Bush does what he feels to do in his heart. He said, he, said, he doesn't care what popular opinion is. He doesn't care what the popular popularity polls say. He, he doesn't care what, what, uh, what, what he faces concerning these things, what adversity he's facing. He says, he says, but he's going to do what's in his heart to do. And I said, wow, Dennis Miller is looking at President Bush's heart. Whoa. That's not what you hear people doing today with President Bush. Do, do they talk about his heart or they talk about how he says nuclear? <laughs> Look at his heart. This is not a political statement. I'm not taking that. I'm just making my point. At what do you look when you look at people? God is looking at the heart. <clears throat> now, Eliab, though outwardly looking the part, was really, as we're going to see, critical. As we're going to see later on, he was negative. He put, he put people down. And the God says, I reject him. Now, I want you to tell me, why did God reject Eliab? Tell me. What? His heart. Why do we get rejected sometimes when we want something why do we not get that raise or that position or, or, or that advancement? Why can we not sometimes get along with our spouse, our children? How does your heart look? Why, why is it sometimes we can't forgive? First Samuel 16, 11 says this. So he asked Jesse, see, Samuel's confused now. Okay, where are the, these are the boys? None of, them, none of them are him. He went through seven boys. And, and then uh, 1611 says, so he asked Jesse, are, are these all the sons you have? Uh, well, he says, well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. <laughs> but but he's, he's just a little kid. He's just out there tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Now, I, I think it's interesting here that David's own dad did not see a king in David. His own, his own father did not see greatness in his child. 
Now, this is David. This is David. 66 chapters in the Bible are written about David. 59 verses in the New Testament reference David. The Son of God is also called the Son of David. He established the the most popular, most well-known city in the whole world, Jerusalem. Over half of the Psalms, over 75 Psalms, were written by David. David. And his own father didn't see greatness in the guy. What do you see in your children? I get, I get so upset with parents sometimes when I hear them talking about their kids. They call them stupid or fat or skinny or, or an accident. You know, you're nothing but trouble. We never did that. We told our kids how great they were. You can do anything. You're brilliant. You're the best. What do you see in your child? And what do you look at your, in your child? The, the goofy things? We never accented the goofy things our kids did. We adjusted them. It's not like they didn't do them. <laughs> But, but what we looked at was their heart. And what do you look at with your child? The goofy things they do? Or do you look at their heart? I'll ask you one more question. At what does God look at your child? God looks at the heart. Now, David had no idea all this was going on. David was out in the pastures doing what he was supposed to be doing, keeping sheep. And, he, and that's what we should do, right? The Bible says, do whatever you do with all of your might as unto the Lord. And, and David was out there doing it with all of his might as unto the Lord. He was doing, he was keeping those few, few sheep until God anointed him to do something else. And, and you know, that's what I did in life. You know, I, I did everything I do. I, I'm, we, you know, we just did that series, and, and then some. <laughs> you remember that one? And, and then I'm an and then some person. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm an and then some now person. Do it with all of your mind. And then, and then, and then 1 Samuel chapter 16 says this, verse 12. So he sent and had him brought, speaking of David, brought in, and he was ruddy. Now, the word ruddy just simply means it was reddish tint, reddish tint. His hair was sort of had a reddish tint. It gets from, like, like if I had hair and I, <laughs> and I was out in the sun, it would, it would, it would lighten. But it, an Israeli's hair will t- get a reddish tint. So he was in the sun a lot. That's what, it, that's what this is telling us. But now watch this. Now, he was with a fine appearance and handsome features. He looked good. One, one of the... One of the uh, translations that I have talks about his eyes. He had gorgeous eyes. He's a good-looking guy. It was just interesting to me that God made sure he wasn't there with the other seven. That he wanted to make sure that Samuel learned the lesson. Samuel, all of this, these things are nice. See, David, David took care of himself. David was concerned about his appearance, obviously. But God wasn't concerned about his appearance. God was looking at his heart. He was a handsome feature. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. Read that to me. He is the one. Let's all say that together. He is the one. I nearly nearly titled our lesson, He's the One. Take that down just for a second, and I'll finish it in just a second, because I really want to work with us here just a moment. I want to to hang on this. Um, He is the one. Now, how many many of you you dads have a daughter, and, and she has a boyfriend, and... And, and she thinks that he is the one. Is he? Or, or if, you, if, you, if you got a guy, if you got a boy, and he's got a gal, and he thinks that she is the one. How, how do you know? How, how do you know? Because, because they got really nice clothes? Or they come from a really nice family? Or they got a really good education? How do you know? How did did God know that that David was the one? Because God is looking at the heart. And when your children grow up, you better not look at the family they came from or the clothes they wear or the education they have. 
you better learn to look at the heart. Reading on, he's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. It was always there, but now there is a power. David wasn't a sloppy person. He took a lot of pride in his parents. And though God looks at the heart, he doesn't mind if we look nice. He doesn't mind the nice clothes. He doesn't mind the nice house, the nice vehicles. He doesn't mind us having money. But what God's really interested in is the heart because God looks at the heart. Samuel anointed David. Now what did David do? Did he run out to the crown store and start trying on crowns? Is that what he did? Let's run down to Super Walmart and see if they got any crowns. And that's not what he did. He go find Saul and say, okay, boy, you're out of here. I'm your replacement. That would have been a bad thing to do, but no, he didn't do that either. What did he do? This is so important. He went back out to his sheep. Do you know that David never mentioned this thing? Now, others mentioned it. It became very well known that David was the anointed. It became very well known, but David never mentioned it. He just went back out and did what he was supposed to do until God opened the door for him. I, you know, I was reminded of, of, of Mary. You know, the angel of the Lord comes to Mary and says, Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby. How can this be? I've not been with a man. His name's going to be Jesus. You know the story. And the Bible says all she did was ponder that in her heart. The Lord looks at the heart. And what in there are you pondering? Hmm. God saw in David what no one else saw. Samuel didn't see it. Jesse didn't see it. His brothers didn't see it. But God saw something. What did God see? God saw David's heart. He was a man after God's own heart. At what is your heart after? Now let's see if you got it. Let's see if you got it. Though I fail and mess up, or though, or though my, my friends, my circle fails and mess up, or though anybody that I know fails and mess up, it does not catch God off guard because God is what? Working behind the scenes. He's working behind your scenes. And though men look at the outward appearance, though men look at the looks, the speech, the diplomas, though men look at the wallet or the house or the vehicles, God looks at the heart. And God is looking at my heart right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of David. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. You give us so much information to learn about life. So much there. Father, I pray that in this series that we'll make these things so applicable, so practical, that, Lord, we'll see that it wasn't just for 1,000 B.C., but it's for 2008, 2009, 2010, 2020. Lord, I pray, Lord, we'll see these things. And we'll ponder them in our hearts. Maybe uh, heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, maybe, maybe you would say, yeah, Delbert, I know you, you really emphasize that all the time, that God's working behind the scenes and, and how, how, uh, how he works all things together for good. I, I, I know that's true. But maybe you're like me, and, and as you realize that God's looking at my heart, maybe, maybe you weren't real proud of what he might be seeing. And, and you would be like me, and you would say, wow, you know what, I need to, I need to do a little house cleaning. I, I, need, to do, I need to do some fix-up here. And, and, you know, you've tried before, but it's just tough. And you need the help of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need him to move in your heart. Without that, it's just not going to happen. And you would say along with me, Lord, come into my heart. I, I want you to find it presentable. I want you to find it acceptable. I want you to be happy about my heart. If, if that's you and, and, and you're like me, would you right where you're sitting, raise your hand and let's just kind of all pray to the, together that God will come in and help us and, and move in our hearts and clean us up some. Would you, would you raise your hand if, if that kind of spoke to you some? I see your hands. I see your hands everywhere. Father, thank you now. Lord, I just pray for all of us. Lord, you're looking at our hearts. And Lord, I ask you right now in Jesus' name, 
that you'll come in with the broom of the Holy Spirit and you'll help us, give us strength to overcome those things that aren't pleasing to you. Help us be more patient. Help us be forgiving. Help us, Lord God. Help us with our hearts. Help us, Lord, to move into the dimension that you want us to move. I ask you to help us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, head still bowed and eyes still closed. Now, now maybe you, in, in, in this particular lesson, that you would say, you know, my life is a roller coaster. Man, nothing ever is smooth. My life is constantly up and down. It's never smooth. And you're not where you need to be with God. And you would say, you know what? I am not where I need to be with God. I really don't like at all what God sees in my heart. And you see, the reason is, is because things aren't working out good for you because you don't love God. Unless you love God, it's not supposed to work out good for you. But when you love God, he makes us a promise. I will take it and I will make it good for you. And if that's you and you know you're not where you need to be with the Lord, and you like to take this day and say, you know what, I want to I make that decision. I want to make that, that, that proclamation right now. I want to step up and I want God back in my life like he's supposed to be. Or maybe you've never received him as your Lord and your Savior, but you'd like to. Maybe that's you. Either case, God wants you back in. He loves you. He wants to make your life good. He wants to come to your house and anoint you to do some great things. But he can't unless you love him. So if that's you today, and you'd like to make that statement right where you're sitting, I'd like you to raise your hand. And I'll just pray for you right there. If that's you, would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you right where you're sitting? I see your hand. Any others? Another one? Another, any more? Another one? Good. Any others? Any others? Let's give the Lord just a moment. See your hand. 